Monster Hunter World. Over 15 million gamers played it, and yet, I'm quite certain nobody has tried this before. Can you beat Monster Hunter World without ever taking any damage? This is impossible, they said. How are you avoiding heat or effluvium damage? Well, to be honest, I had no idea myself if this was possible, but with the power of God and anime by my side, I decided to try it. I shall take no damage and play through the entire Monster Hunter World story from beginning until the end credits after the final boss Zeno Jiva. And yes, any damage counts. Heat damage, lava damage, effluvium damage, chip damage, whatever it may be, I would have to avoid all of it. And so I started this challenge. My chat decided to name ourselves Peak Performance since we're always on max HP and we named our Palico Meat Shield. And so it was time to begin. The rules are simple. We have to play everything in single player to not get any help from other players. No mods are allowed. As soon as I take any damage, I have to reset my save file and completely start over. Once we defeat the final boss in Ojiva without taking damage, we beat this challenge. We finished the tutorial after about 30 minutes and decided to make a checkpoint right after arriving in Astera, because until this point, it's impossible to take any damage and shall I have to reset my save, I can start over from there directly. This is one of the benefits when playing on PC, so I can easily save checkpoints. And so the first quest began. Kill seven small Jagras. And here I already struggled more than I expected. No, 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 never again, Sticky. I decided to start with light bowgun, since this weapon allows me to attack from a distance while being able to always stay in motion as long as I use ammo with low enough recoil. After this quest, we unlocked the smithy and I made the defender light bowgun one. This bowgun is quite a bit stronger than the other bowguns on that same rank, and so I started this second quest to kill a few Castodon, and then Great Jagras appeared, which is the first large monster fight, and then I accidentally reloaded Pierce ammo, which has a long reeled animation, so that Jagras spit right on me. No! I reloaded! Oh, no. The first reset happened and I had to start over. This time I made some preparations and farmed some items and materials. After roughly one hour we made it back to Jagras and it was quite easy. And so I took down Jagras, the first large monster in about 3 minutes without any damage taken. In order to upgrade the Defender Light Bowgun I would need one Anjanath scale and so Chad and I had an idea. Guys can we somehow get an Anjanath scale when Anjanath is in the expedition without kind of fighting Anjanath? We tried getting the scale from footprints, but since there's only a very small chance, about 3%, we decided to clutch claw wallbang Anjanath instead. Every time you wallbang a monster, you'll get a shiny drop, and Anjanath scales have a 50% chance to come from a shiny, which is pretty good. I got the scale first try, returned to Astera and upgraded the Defender Light Bowgun. I decided to use two evading reload mods to be able to avoid reloading completely. I gave Meat Shield a paralysis weapon and some armor to have more defense. Before every large monster hunt, I need to farm some items like flash bugs, thunder bugs, sleep herbs, fire herbs, spider webs, IV power shrooms and nitro shrooms. With materials like these, I can craft items like shock traps, pitfalls, flash pots, bombs, and sleep and power ammo. Farming consumable items takes a long time in this challenge since I can't cultivate any of these without doing additional optional quests and I want to avoid doing any quests I don't absolutely have to do. I also have very limited access to consumable items from the shop at the beginning of the game so I have to farm everything myself. Yo, oh my god, speed crawler right there. The next target was Kuluyaku. We found out that normal level 2 rapid fire is the way to go for most of these monsters. Meat Shield came in clutch with a para and I took down Kudu successfully. Yes! Oh my god, that was a walk in the park! Pookie can be quite tough because of the long range tongue poison attacks. Luckily, I was able to take him out with the help of some traps and mines. Yes! Pookie guys, no damage! Next up is the Wildspire Waste. I farmed some materials and sneaked past Rathian. Do you see that fire, Rathian? Yes, exactly. Come guys, quick! We triggered the Baroth cutscene, went back to Astera to restock items and started the Baroth hunt. Okay, Kelby, bring us to Baroth, let's go! With a lot of flash pods and flaming rapid fire, I was able to get Baroth to less than 50% HP. Yes! Let's go, Kaktua, let's go! Yes! Yes! 
Before we proceeded to Juratodos, I farmed some more Gajau to make the Gajau Leg Piece, which gives the armor skill Aquatic Polar Mobility, which makes me able to move freely in the swamp, and that will help a lot against Juratodos. Do you see this guys how fast we are? I was able to take him down quite easily and finally capture. Yes! Time to go back to the ancient forest to take down Toby Kadachi next. Oh, oh. After defeating Toby, we will unlock para, sleep and poison ammo to buy at the merchant, which will heavily cut down farming time, cause we don't have to make these ammos ourselves anymore. So this is an important one. I farmed some items we needed for Toby and then entered the cutscene. The strategy for Toby was to use sticky level 2 combined with evade reload. Toby was by far the hardest challenge yet. Tried to capture but wasn't ready yet and then got insanely lucky on an accidental reload but was finally able to get him to limp. I farmed some flashbacks again and took on Anjanaf. No! Oh no, everything again. Okay, I I'm starting to hate this challenge. <laughs> that meant I had to reset back to killing 7 small Jagras. Luckily, I was able to progress quite quickly after I've learned where all the plants and mushrooms grow and where to find flashbacks. I took down Great Jagras, went for the Anjanaf scale again, took down Kulu, Pookie, Baroth, Juratodos and Tobikadachi again. All without taking a single HP point in damage. And then arrived at Anjanath once again. And oh boy, this time I demolished Anjanath. He has a 75 weak point to shot damage on the tail which is super high and so when constantly keeping pressure on it with normal level 2 rapid fire, I was able to get many claggers giving me new openings to deal more damage. So eventually I was able to capture Anjanath in a pitfall trap. Please, yes, yes, progress. We finally made it to the first Zora quest. It turned out the magma cores emit heat even during their calm phase as well. By getting close enough to them, you get passive heat damage. Not much, but a little bit. Sadly, I thought only the eruption itself deals damage. <laughs> that means going all the way back to killing seven small jaggers. Then I did everything again until I got back to Baroth. <laughs> Since when does it like one damage? When you get hit from a monster's area transition animation, no matter how much defense you have, it will deal exactly one HP point in damage. So that meant back to killing seven small jackers again. It was obvious that at that point the challenge became quite grindy, so my chat and I decided the full rules for this challenge. We decided to make three checkpoints in the entire story where we could save our game. After we finished the first Zora Magdaros quest, we would be able to save the game and make our first checkpoint. So should we take any damage moving forward, we could fall back to that save point after Zora. We decided to do that since the game is really grindy due to constantly farming support items and it's more about showcasing a good strategy in a flawless hunt rather than literally wasting my life away by redoing the same 7 small Jagras quest 100 times. I would still have to reset my safe if I take damage, but these are the three checkpoints that I can fall back to. The first one after the first Zora quest, the second one after the second Zora quest, which is the transition to high rank, and lastly after the flagship Nergigante is killed. When I got back to Anjanath, the shiny drops decided not to give any scales. On the third shiny, I almost took damage, then again no scale, and then finally on the fifth shiny, a scale dropped. Then doing all of the other monsters again until we finally made it to Zora Magdaros once again. So the goal was to complete this quest completely damageless and then could finally save the game. At the end of this Zora quest, Nergigante will appear and in order to progress, I have to deal 200 damage and then Nergigante will leave the area. Plan was to put Nergigante to sleep, use bombs and light bogan mines to deal easy 200 damage and finish this section. Here's how that went. So quickly! Why? Oh no! Well, back to killing seven small Jagras and all of the other monsters again. I was able to get a cool finisher on Pookie with Slinger ammo and another one on Baroth, and then made it past all the other monsters again, 
This time, I had a new plan for no Gigante. I started with the Gilly Mantle right away and then shot 3 Sleep Level 2. During the falling into sleep animation, I would shoot 3 Poison Level 2 to trigger a poison. Then, in order not to risk the lava to wake up Nergigante early again, I used Sticky for an instant wake up and normal level 2 for the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, after 18 hours and resetting 9 times, we finally made it to the first checkpoint. Yes! Next up was Paolumu. First try, damageless. Then it became interesting. The first quest in the Rotten Vale, Radoban. Luckily, you fight Radoban only in the upper levels of the Rotten Vale, where there is no environmental effluvium. Radoban has a few wide hitbox attacks, which make him quite dangerous. Here, I used two recoil suppressor mods again, since they bring normal level to rapid fire on the lowest recoil level, so I can shoot faster. I was able to get Radoban to limp and finally capture. The next objective was to sight a great Jiros, but the problem here is we would have to advance into a section of the Rotten Vale which is covered fully in effluvium. So, in order to be able to go there, I would need protection. First, you would think, Vitality Mantle. But the problem is, the Vitality Mantle is only unlocked later in the story after Odoguron, so we don't have that yet. Luckily, there was one other way. The armor skill Effluvium Expert, which comes with the Hornet Tower lowering chest, is a single point skill which protects you fully against all environmental effluvium tick damage. This is exactly what I needed, but unfortunately, Hornet Towers are quite dangerous to farm when you cannot take any damage. With the help of my poison ammo, I was able to carve enough materials, craft the chest, farm some more consumable items for the next fight, and progress into the effluvium. Eh, eh. Oh my god, we're safe! No damage! I sighted the Great Jeros, which luckily doesn't have to be fought, and then back to Astera. I farmed some more consumable items for Legiana and began the next quest. Legiana was by far the hardest monster yet. After more than 30 minutes, I finally got Legiana to fly to its nest and capture. Yes! 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 <laughs> then Chad and I decided we should farm the Shield Spire Palico gadget because it would help us a lot moving forward since it draws attention away from myself and onto the Palico. The next monster to fight was a Dolgoron. After this one, we would unlock the Vitality Mantle. So this was an important quest. Finish the cutscene and then encounter the Dolgoron in its nest area. So we'll start with a wall bang. Wish me luck, guys. Ho ho. I had Gilly Mantle on! Maybe because we already encountered a Dogoron. So I reset back to Zora, farmed the Shield Spire again, did Paolumo again, and then this happened. Was that wind pressure? Farmed the Shield Spire again, did Paolumo again, and then this happened. Scared. <laughs> Got sick of farming Shield Spire over and over again, so I decided not to farm it anymore. I did Paolumo again, this time successfully. Did all the other monsters again, then decided to craft the Slugger Charm and the Anginoth Arms to get one more special ammo boost skill point, which helps me a lot to deal more damage with Light Bogan Mines, which I use all the time. Farmed flashbacks again, did Legiana again, this time with a proper strategy. I was using two evading reload mods to focus on sticky damage because it allowed me to stay on distance, whereas normal level 2 has a critical range and it requires you to be quite close in order to deal the decent damage. Oh! Cap! Yes! That was much, much easier. But you guys know why? Because we are using evading reload. I knew it. Evading reload and sticky is the key to victory here. I got to the Odogoron cutscene. This time, I returned to Astara and accepted the quest again so that Odogoron spawns in a better area to fight in. And oh boy, Odogoron was a lot harder than Legiana. Oh. Oh no, no, no. I started all over again and then this happened. So we're we're good now. Oh. <laughs> I started all over again, did Paolumu, and then farmed the Hornet Tower chest. Oh! Jesus! Thank God they they jumped so high. I think it I would have gotten hit. Oh no! Radoban. I'll dunk him away, but. 
So I did everything again. This time I farmed the Hornetar chest with a new strategy. It turned out torch pods have a special effect on insects. It manipulates their behavior. Fire will draw them to it and they will stay there close to the fire almost paralyzed without attacking and so I was able to safely obtain the chest. You shall not pass! Look at you, pathetic insects! Then I defeated Legiana again. This time I had a strategy for Dogron because it's such a fast monster. I again used two recoil suppressors for maximum normal level 2 speed. The strategy was quite simple. Focus firing on the legs until Odogron falls over and that can happen multiple times per hunt. Then plant mines doing the stagger for maximum damage and repeat. I took down Odogron damageless and now it was time for Rathalos and Diablos, the last two monsters before the second Zora Magdaros quest, which is a transition from low to high rank and also our second checkpoint in the game. So then I decided to quickly gather some Devil's Blight mushrooms in the Rotten Vale to be able to craft stronger Mega Barrel Bombs to use them on Rathalos and Diablos for some extra damage. And so I did everything again until I finally took down Odogron again. Now I decided to not farm anything and instead move on right away to Rathalos. This time I promised to myself Vespoids would never ever ruin my runs ever again. Rathalos flew away and so I waited in his nest for him to return and decided to quickly kill these Vespoids so they wouldn't interfere later when fighting Rathalos. It was at that moment when my heart shattered into a thousand pieces, but I kept going. And so I did everything again, and then this happened. I reset a few more times, trying to somehow make it back to Rathalos, and then when farming the Hornetar chest, this happened. Oh! I'm out. A random Radaban spawned underneath me and so I reset. And after hours and hours, I finally managed to get back to Rathalos without any damage taken. The strategy for Rathalos was now to first trigger the waterfall with the help of one light bowgun mine to make sure we don't have to fight in this area where the Vespoids are. Then I jumped down and used normal level 2 with minimum recall plus using power asleep and traps and one sticky KO and lots of flash bombs to support. Ah! Limping! Yes! I was finally ready to capture Rathalos and went to his nest. We are safe if... <gasps> so I decided to play it safe and captured Rathalos about 5 minutes later when he was asleep. It felt so good to finally make some progress. The strategy for Diablos was simple too. Bring enough Screamer and Flash Pods to lock it down and shoot Sticky for KO a normal level 2 on the wings. Diablos have a high weak point to shot damage on the wings, precisely a hit zone of 60. So I used this to my advantage, but after almost taking damage to a Castodon, I was able to finish Diablos as well without taking any damage. Finally, the second Zora Magdaros quest, the last quest and transition to high rank, which is our second checkpoint in the story. I decided to farm the Kuduyaku Vembraces for Pro Transporter to be able to carry cannonballs with more speed. Furthermore, the High Metal Greaves come with Heavy Artillery Level 1, an armor skill which increases damage from all cannonballs and ballista by a whopping 50%. Since Iceborne, this skill was improved drastically. We also decided to use the Vitality Mantle to be protected from Barnos. The way this mantle works is, it gives you an additional 100 HP, which absorbs damage. As soon as these 100 HP are gone, the mantle will apply the remaining damage onto your health. And so defense is really important. The more defense you have, the more damage will Vitality Mantle absorb for you with this extra 100 HP. So I used the Guardian Coil Alpha Plus for more defense, making us able to tank hits from Barnos easily during the 2 minutes where the Vitality Mantle is active. So we have to wait just over 60 seconds. If we return to Astara then, we will be able to start the quest over without the cutscene at the beginning and that makes us directly spawn in the camp where we are safe. This also allows us to safely deal damage with cannons and ballista. I made sure I hit all three boulders and all cannons and all ballista until we have to transition to the barrier. On the barrier, the plan was to use the cannons loaded by NPCs first, then use Dragonator, then back to NPC cannons, and due to the amount of extra damage from heavy artillery, Zora went down faster than the commander ever imagined. And so, 
we finally arrived in high rank. High rank, baby! High rank, baby! Yeah! With the newly acquired Defender Light Bowgun 3, I took down high rank Pokey Pokey. I upgraded my Palico gear to high rank and started the high rank Anjanath quest. Oh my god! Vitality Mantle, thank you so much! Vitality came in clutch, then Baroth almost ended the run and I finally captured Anjanath. We decided to farm some new gear to get better skills and more defense to make the Vitality Mantle tank more damage and settled with this quite solid mix of attack level 4, artillery level 2, master gatherer, slugger and special ammo boost. Then gathered all the Pingrathian tracks and started the high rank Pingrathian hunt to quickly get one scale to upgrade the Light Bowgun to defender level 4. Pink Rathian was tough, but after some time she was close to death and then this happened. You know what? The vest point scared me, oh no! I started over, but this time I found the perfect spot to farm Pink Rathian tracks quickly. I farmed the entire mix set again that we had previously, downed Anjanath and got back to Pink Rathian. I finally managed to capture her and so I advanced into the Elder's Recess to get the Nergigante quest. The plan for Nagigante was to use Sticky to not bounce with normal shots on black spikes, so I decided to farm Anjanath quickly to upgrade my armor to level 3, which I probably shouldn't have done. I started over and got some more resets, farmed Hyrek Anjanath 3 times to get artillery level 3 and then almost took damage to Pink Rathian because of Blue Boy. No, no! Yes! Yes! I got to the Eldest Recess again, and the first thing I did is I farmed the Barnos Chest for its armor skill Heat Guard, which not only negates all heat damage, so we don't need any cold drinks, but it also negates all environmental lava damage. So that allows me to move freely in hot areas without worrying about damage. Nice! Look at this, guys. We're invincible! I had to encounter Levazioth, Uragan and Dorogama and then it was time for Nergigante. I did a few test runs with my main character and we quickly noticed that Sticky Recall is way too dangerous. And normal level 2 with 2 Recall and 1 Reload mod is in fact the safest strategy. I also noticed another problem. Nergigante does these random bunny hops which deal chip damage and can barely be avoided, so it was at this point in the game where I absolutely needed the Vitality Mantle and that meant that I needed more defense. So we used all armor spheres to upgrade the current armor. We also had an idea. When farming our Gigante tracks, there is a 3% chance to get an Immortal Dragon scale, so we decided to use Gilly Mantle to try to get one scale to be able to upgrade the Defender Light Bowgun to level 5. But the Gilly Mantle only lasts for 2 minutes. But as long as you stand still and not move, mantles don't expire. So Chad and I had an idea. Using gestures also counts as not moving. So while performing gestures, the mantle lasts indefinitely. But the catch is, there is one new gesture introduced with Iceborne called Kabuki, and it allows us to do this. Something like this, if you guys know what I mean. <laughs> kabuki, yeah, it's Kabuki. Let's take a look at the mantle, it should not expire. It doesn't expire, guys. <laughs> use the bow's gesture in order to turn our character. If we use this, and then we Kabuki. <laughs> We decided to start the Nagigante quest, since no matter how much I tried, I didn't get any immortal dragon scales, and wall bangs weren't an option either, since they dropped just other Nagigante materials. So we ended up not upgrading the Light Bowgun. The strategy here was to make optimal use of the Vitality Mantle and fuck us up back into the camp as soon as the mantle expired. During the Vitality Mantle uptime, we can tank all chip damage from the bunny hops. We could still not tag any major hits from Nergigante, we don't have enough defense for that, but normal attacks can be evaded for the most part, so that was okay. After about 12 minutes, Nergigante limped back to his nest. For the first time, I had two Mega Barrel Bombs for more wake-up damage, but it wasn't enough to take him down, and I didn't have Vitality Mantle active, so I decided to Farkast it back into camp to play it safe. Also because of these crystals dropping from the ceiling, which are quite dangerous. Vitality Mantle was back, and luckily Nerg was sleeping again, so I went for another wake-up. Please die. Yes! 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 We reached the third and final checkpoint and finally I could save the game. At that point, there were only four Elder Dragons left to beat the game. 
Teostra, Kushala, Val, and Senojiva. I gathered some footprints in the Rotten Vale to unlock Val and began the quest. Unlike environmental effluvium, which can be fully negated with effluvium expert, here in this case there is nothing we can do to protect ourselves from Valhazak's effluvium, except using Vitality Mantle again. So as soon as Vitality Mantle ran out, I took effluvium damage and had to reset. Oh no! Oh. I tried Val again and took effluvium damage again just after the mantle expired. I reset and decided to continue with Teostra instead to get some more practice. The good thing is, the game lets you choose which one of the three elders, Theo, Kusha or Val, you want to do first. Surprisingly, by just keeping high pressure on the head and without even waiting for Vitality Mantle to recharge, I was able to defeat Theo damageless on the first try. Yes! First try, boys! Let's go! No practice! First try. I farmed flashbacks again in Kushala tracks and then onto Kushala. This fight was surprisingly manageable. With the help of my Bogon mines and flash pods, I was able to defeat Kushala first try. Yes! My new strategy for Val was to only engage during my Telti Mantle uptime. Shortly before the mantle expires, I would Fakasa back to camp. I made sure to farm enough Excite Shrooms and smoke berries in advance to be able to craft far casters. It was a time-consuming strategy, since I only had a time window of 2 minutes to actually deal damage during Vitality Mantle and then had to wait 6 minutes in the camp for the mantle to recharge. I focused my fire mainly on the head and occasionally on the tail peak, which are weak points to shot damage. It took just shy of 40 minutes, but the strategy turned out to be effective. I didn't take any damage at all, not even to effluvium. Oh! Valazak! Yes! Third clear! No damage taken, boys! Let's go! Today is the day, dude! And to everybody's surprise here, we already stood before the final boss in Ojiva. I did a few test runs with my main character just to test the waters and I have to say I was completely blown away by how difficult it was to pull this off damageless. After about a dozen test runs, I still wasn't able to take down Zeno without taking any damage. Zeno has 15,000 HP even in solo and no matter what I tried, I wasn't able to succeed. There was chip damage which occurred frequently every time Zeno moved past me and touched me with its legs. There were white hitbox attacks which were almost impossible possible to dodge at times. I tried to beat it so many times with my main character but no success. I was sure I would be able to beat it at some point, but the problem was that every time I would fail by taking any amount of damage on Zeno once, I would have to reset my entire save file back to Nergigante and I really didn't want to do all the other Elder Dragons every time again, damageless, just to get another attempt at Zeno. I honestly accepted the fact that this challenge was impossible to beat in any reasonable time whatsoever. This guy was just too tanky and too hard to beat without getting at least hit once. So I decided to take a final look into the database and search for any other possible solutions to get past Zeno. And then I spotted something very interesting. Senojiva's weakness particularly to poison. I noticed the database provides one info how much total damage Zeno takes if it's poisoned. And according to this source, it deals a whopping 800 damage. For comparison, Rathian and Rathalos only take 160 damage when poisoned. Diablos and Teostra take 320. Kushala, which is a 3-star weakness to poison, only takes 520. Again, Zeno takes 800, by far more than almost every other monster in this game. So I was thinking, is there any other way for me to take down Xenojiva with poison? Because with the Defender Light Bowgun, I can shoot 4 poison level 2 in one reload, which is really good. Eventually, Chad and I had an idea. One idea which could rescue this entire damageless project. I'm talking about an armor skill called Pink Rathian Mastery, which I'm sure less than 1% of you guys watching this video have ever considered using. Three high rank Pink Rathian armor parts grant us the set bonus mastery skill Poison Duration Up, which extends the active duration of poison. One poison on Zeno normally lasts for exactly two minutes. In order to find out by how much this skill extends the duration, we stop the poison time in a test run. What? It's still poisoned! No way! Wait! Wait, it's over three minutes! Four minutes! It's it's gone. It's gone guys. Yeah. 
It's double duration. Oh my god. So that means, guys, that is 1600 damage. With this skill, our poison will not only last for a whopping 4 minutes, but it will also deal 1600 damage. This is absolutely insane. I have hope. I have hope. Yes. Yes. So I did the math. 15,000 HP minus the damage from 4 boulders, minus X amount of poison activations. The calculation was around 8 poisons are needed. With some extra damage, 7 poisons could be just enough. The next question was, how much does the poison resistance from Xenojiva, aka the threshold to poison, per poison activation increase over time? Or in other words, how many more shots increasingly of poison level 2 will we need to shoot at Xeno in order to get a successful poison the more times we poison Xenojiva. And with poison tech level 4, that turned out to be pretty manageable. With 12 shots of poison level 2 ammo, I would easily be able to trigger a poison even after Xeno was already poisoned 6 times, where Xeno reaches the maximum poison resistance. But there was one more problem. While trying to poison Xenojiva, I would be very vulnerable to its attacks, because even if I had the Vitality Mantle on, I could not even tank one single laser beam since Zeno's attack stats are so high. I did some testing with my main character and found out with a little over 400 defense, I would be able to tank almost every major hit from Zeno at least once. So that meant I needed to farm around 50 advanced armor spheres to upgrade my armor as much as possible. But there was another problem. If we need 7 poisons and if we calculate the recharge time of 6 minutes from Vitality Mantle in between every poison activation, we would exceed the 50 minutes quest time limit and fail the quest. Luckily, we found a solution. With Tool Specialist Level 3, the recharge time for Vitality Mantle is lowered from 6 minutes to merely 4 minutes and 12 seconds. And our poison duration lasts 4 minutes anyway where we have to wait it out in the camp. And even more lucky for us, Tool Specialist comes automatically with the Pink Rathian armor that I needed to farm anyway, because I needed 3 Pink Rathian armor parts to activate the set bonus skill Poison Duration up. So that was it. We finally found a strategy. All I needed now to do was to farm the build, and unfortunately, I had to do Pink Rathian again multiple times without taking any damage. Or otherwise, I would have to reset all the way back to Nergi Ganze. This one hurt a lot, because it ruined at least 10 hours of progress. We had to farm it, guys. There was no other way to beat Zeno. That's the thing. I mean, this is the only thing about flash bombs. The random charges that go uncontrolled, you don't know if she goes for you or not. At least we now had a strategy for Zenojiva. I reset my save file and searched for Kushala footprints and took down Kushala again. But then I took damage to Teostra, so I reset and farmed flashbacks again, then started with Teostra, took damage and reset again. Then finally took Tio down again, and also Kushala, and then made it to Val. Danny DeVito wouldn't give up. Okay, let, let's let's ask him what he thinks about this. Danny, yo, what do you think? Yeah, I think Chris, uh, try this again, uh, please. Uh, uh, you can do it. I have faith in you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Danny. That's, I really appreciate that. But even though Danny DeVito believed in us, Val's wing had a hitbox and somehow it hit me, and so I had to reset again. Then I reset a few more times on Val, so I decided to start with Tio instead, and also had to reset twice on Tio. At this point, my own patience was my biggest enemy. Oh, wait, I'm burning? Wait, 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 what? It turned out that Teostra created a fire patch on top of lava on the ground, which was very hard to spot, and even Heathguard does not protect you against these from Teostra. Then, while trying to get the footprints for the Teostra quest again, this happened. Oh! I knew it! Then back at Teostra, I caught one of its instant charges, then I finally downed Teostra, then decided to continue farming the Poison Mastery build for Zeno instead, before taking on Kushala and Val, so I started farming Pink Rathian. We cannot underestimate her. We be very careful. As soon as the mantle is gone, I think I'll just drop out. And so I flashed her and ran out of the area to recharge the mantle. Let's leave. Let's be super careful now. Um. Oh. 
then I had a new strategy. I would start farming Pingrathia materials first and do the other dragons afterwards. The good thing about that was almost all of the parts I needed to craft the poison armor can be obtained with either wall banks or tail cuts. So if I did that, I could heavily cut down the amount of times I would actually need to farm Pankrathian. Unfortunately, I had to reset twice during that process as well. <laughs> but finally, with the help of the Defender Greatsword 4, I was able to get 4 Rathian Spikes plus by just cutting tails. And because tails cannot be cut during the boulder stagger, I was able to get the most stylish of tail cuts. <laughs> it works! Let's go! <laughs> I wallbanked her a few times to get carpuses and scales, then I almost took damage in the process, that was kinda close, but I got what I needed and crafted the arms. Then I wallbanked a few basils to get the talents to craft power and armor talents, and then Barnos almost ended the run here if I hadn't used Vitality Mantle. I also needed some Shamos hide. Fun fact, we noticed that Shamos sounds like a horse if you kill it. They make horse noise. Holy smokes. It sounds like a horse. Then I captured one high rank Pookie to make the waist part. And then the last parts needed for the armor were five monster hard bones. So I farmed Pink Rathian a few times. Luckily, I was able to finish her twice without taking any damage and got the five bones. Even if Basil almost ended the run again. In order to further boost the defense, I need to farm adamant seeds, hardship powder and mega armor skins. Now, with about 400 defense, I knew I could at least tank one attack from Elder Dragons during Vitality Mantle uptime. And that was super important, because at this point, I had to play very carefully. I started with Kushala, had a few close calls, but ended up taking it down. Tioster was very tough, especially with stakes that high. Val, on the other hand, was quite smooth this time. Yes! Guys, we're before Zenuchiva, finally! Oh my god, take it. it's taken freaking 65 hours, man. I had to farm some smoke nuts and excite shrooms to craft Thakasters before taking on Xenojiva, because after every poison, I need to go back to the camp to refill ammo and recharge the mantle. With the last armor spheres to max out defense, I got to 418 defense without defense food. And here we are, the time has finally come. We will find out if our poison strategy works. In the first phase, there are four boulders. Each of these deals 758 damage, which is really high. That plus one poison and some normal level 2 rapid fire did actually just enough damage to trigger the second phase. Until here, the calculation perfectly worked. Immediately after spawning in the second area, I farcasted back to the camp to switch to the two specialist build. Then I refreshed items and waited for about 3 minutes in the camp. Shortly before Vitality Mantle was recharged, I switched back to the Heat Guard build and then buffed myself with defense items. And then it was time for the second poison. I would continue this exact process 5 more times until Xenojiva is poisoned exactly 7 times. So let me explain how poison works. Monsters take damage from poison, but the catch is they cannot actually die from poison. Meaning if a monster gets to 1 HP while still being poisoned, it will remain on 1 HP until you do any other type of hit that deals at least one damage to the monster and then triggers the kill. Since again, poison can't actually trigger the kill for a monster. So the idea was to use a boomerang to get the final hit, because boomerang does one damage. After the seventh poison, I wasn't sure if Zeno was at one HP already, but I decided to give it a shot nonetheless. Yes! <laughs> Boomerang! Seven poisons! Let's go! Yes! Ladies and gentlemen, we officially beat Monster Hunter World without taking any damage. It's just incredible that this was even possible. Thanks to everyone who was watching this challenge live on Twitch. Honestly, without my Twitch chat, this would have never been possible. For everyone else watching on YouTube, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This was so much work to produce and I seriously need some editing support in the future when making more videos like these for YouTube. I'm doing similar challenges on my Twitch channel at the moment, in Monster Hunter World, also in older Monster Hunter games and also in Pokemon games. So if you're into the live experience, you're welcome to hang out with us over there on Twitch. I always stream Monday to Fridays. 
With that being said, this is Chris from Team Darkseid, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.